This podcast is made possible by our supporters on Patreon, who pledge an amount to contribute every month and in return get exclusive access to bonus content, merchandise discounts, and much more. If you'd like to join our family, please go to patreon.com slash Gotham Variety and subscribe. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N slash Gotham Variety. And greetings to you. Joe Rubenstein here, producer and host of the Gotham Variety Podcast. I want to welcome all of our listeners. I thank you very much for your support and for joining me today. Hoping you enjoy this latest episode of Real Time 1960s, a kind of ongoing parallel universe of 60 years ago, where I document and reflect on that decade in real time through podcasts and daily social media posts on our Facebook page. And if you'd like to live or relive the 1960s in a sort of day-to-day way, please check it out, facebook.com slash realtime 1960s. Last time we talked about Kennedy versus Nixon, but today a sharp turn into darker regions, uh, infernal regions actually, as we take a hard look at one of the primary organizers of the Nazi genocide, Adolf Eichmann, who 60 years ago today was sitting in a prison cell uh, preparing for his trial in Jerusalem. Born in Germany in 1906, but raised in Austria, actually he attended the same high school that Hitler had 17 years earlier, Eichmann became increasingly drawn to the Nazis starting around 1927, uh, when uh, despite increasing membership, the Nazis were still performing very poorly at the polls, uh, getting just 2.6% of the vote in the national election of 1928. But those numbers would shift dramatically in their favor after the crash of 1929 and the total collapse of the German economy. Uh, Eichmann joined the Austrian branch of the party in 1932, and the following year, uh, right after Hitler took power, joined the SS, uh, or Schutzstaffel, that means Protection Squadron, uh, the Nazis' elite paramilitary organization. In 1934, he was invited to join the Office of Jewish Affairs, which sounds innocent, but uh, he was tasked with, quote-unquote, encouraging the Jews of Germany to leave Europe and resettle elsewhere. Uh, This encouragement uh, took the form of alternating violence and economic pressure, and roughly a quarter million Jews did leave Germany between 1933 and 1939. But once the war broke out, uh, official policy changed to, uh, well, first, forced deportation. Between 1939 and 41, entire Jewish communities were transported to ghettos uh, throughout occupied Eastern Europe, and these ghettos were sealed off with brick or barbed wire. Uh, The largest in Warsaw, uh, at its height, had half a million people uh, living within 1.3 square miles, an average of nine people per room. It would have been more crowded if not for the fact that roughly a third of the deportees died in transit in crowded train cars with no food or water. But the death rate in those ghettos, either from starvation or disease, uh, usually typhus, was extremely high. And Eichmann, who engineered these deportations, uh, later claimed at his trial uh, to have been bothered by these conditions, but wartime documents and correspondence show that his only concern was to achieve the deportations as efficiently as possible uh, with minimal disruption to the war effort, and that he did. Now, there are two critical junctures I would point to that massively accelerated the Holocaust. Uh, The first was Operation Barbarossa, Hitler's uh, ill-advised invasion of the Soviet Union in June of 1941, when the Einsatzgruppen, uh, meaning deployment groups, they were death squads, would trail the German army, the Wehrmacht, into conquered areas, round up every Jew they could find, and kill them usually by shooting, uh, sometimes over pits that the victims were forced to dig, sometimes over natural ravines, sometimes on mass gallows. And it was here that the Nazis uh, started to experiment with gas. Uh, They would load their victims into vans and then uh, pump in uh, carbon monoxide. So early prototypes for the gas chambers. But the numbers involved with these various massacres are truly mind-boggling. One of the worst was at a place called Babi Yar, a large ravine in Kiev, the Ukrainian capital, where the Einsatzgruppen killed almost 34,000 Jews in just a two-day period, the last two days of September 1941, 
And then a month later in Odessa, uh, the death toll was even higher. There, in order to speed up uh, the process and save ammunition, many of the victims were forced into gasoline-covered barracks, which were then set on fire. And Eichmann, by the way, uh, received regular reports of these activities all the way through. So Barbarossa was critical juncture number one. Number two came just after the Battle of Moscow, uh, which the Germans, after three long months, finally lost in January of 1942. The Soviets were finally able to defend that city uh, while taking just staggering losses. But it was after this defeat that Hitler uh, decided to kill all the Jews in occupied territories as quickly as possible. Any chance of a quick German victory was now gone. Uh, The Eastern Front was a mess. The Americans had just come into the war, so there would be no delaying Hitler's other war, the war against the Jews. And this decision uh, and all of its ramifications were established at the Wannsee Conference on January 20th, 1942. Wannsee is a suburb of Berlin where senior Nazis, including Eichmann, uh, hammered out the details of what they called the final solution to the Jewish question. But as I said, this so-called question was well on its way to being solved by the Nazis already. Not just by the Einsatzgruppen, who killed 1.3 million Jews, but a number of death camps, including Auschwitz, uh, were already doing steady business. And many others, uh, thousands in fact, were under construction. But the goal was clear, the extinction of the Jewish population of Europe and any other territory that Nazi Germany controlled. And Eichmann and company would prove diabolically effective in achieving that goal. So that's a kind of whirlwind tour of the early stages of this uh, historical catastrophe, and also an introduction to this two-part episode, which, rather than focusing on a single event of the 60s, will cover a much longer stretch of time. Uh, today, from 1944 to about 1959, and next time, 59 to 62. And my research was drawn from many sources, but a good deal of it from an excellent book I can highly recommend called Hunting Eichmann by Neil Bascom. So Adolf Eichmann, top 10 facts, right after this. You can follow us on Twitter, at Gotham Variety, like us on Facebook, subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. We're on Spotify as well. Check out our website at GothamVariety.com, where you can send us your comments and questions. And if you love what we're doing, we'd love a five-star review on the podcast platform of your choice. Reviews and ratings help keep our show on the charts, so more and more people can find us. Okay, we've got a lot to cover, so let's dive right in. Uh, Fact number one. After the Wannsee Conference, Adolf Eichmann developed and refined a deliberate four-stage process by which to annihilate the Jews of any given region or city, and he approached that task uh, very much like a corporate executive, setting lofty goals, recruiting talent, delegating some tasks, traveling constantly to observe and uh, tally his results, evaluating data and making adjustments, and reporting his progress to his immediate superior, uh, the first of whom was Reinhard Heydrich, uh, whom Hitler called the man with the iron heart. I guess from him uh, that was a compliment. Heydrich uh, was truly one of the darkest figures in the Nazi regime, which is saying a mouthful. He was directly responsible uh, for the Einsatzgruppen, and he also chaired the Wannsee Conference. But after Heydrich was assassinated by Czechoslovakian soldiers in the spring of 1942, Eichmann reported to Heinrich Himmler, head of the SS, and the only two men who ranked higher than Himmler uh, were Goering and Hitler. So I'm going to lay out the four stages of Eichmann's process uh, using Hungary, which was kind of his last hurrah as an example. And then I'm going to kind of zoom in and explore the impact of that process on a specific person, just because, you know, when you're dealing with the kind of numbers we're dealing with, it's easy to get lost in abstractions. And I don't want to do that. So once the Germans occupied Hungary in March of 1944 and the SS and the Gestapo were installed, it was time for stage one, isolation. Jews had to wear the yellow star at all times. Uh, They were prohibited from traveling, uh, forbidden to own or use telephones or radios. Uh, They were banned from working in the civil service and really every other major profession. And that's just a few of literally hundreds of restrictions that were enforced. 
Then came stage two, appropriation. All Jewish bank accounts were frozen. Any business or factory owned by a Jew or Jews uh, was seized. All their assets were stolen. And by the way, that included ration cards. So Jews could only obtain food through the black market. So stages one and two effectively rendered the Jewish population uh, helpless, hungry, and appropriately terrified, uh, setting them up for the kill. Stage three was physical separation. Jewish families were forced out of their homes at gunpoint and herded into the ghettos I've already described. And finally, uh, stage four, uh, deportation to death camps. The Jews of Hungary were sent to Auschwitz, where those who weren't killed immediately were used for slave labor or as the subjects of gruesome medical experiments. And one of the many sad and really infuriating facts about all this is that the SS, uh, not just in Hungary, but really every region of occupied Europe, had help from local authorities. A lot of help. There was at least as much uh, deep-rooted anti-Semitism in these places as there was in Germany, going back to the Middle Ages when Jews were falsely blamed uh, for the outbreak of the Black Death, the bubonic plague, and murdered by the thousands, many of them burned alive. So it was an old business, it was a filthy business, and the Hungarian uh, gendarmes in 1944 uh, were more than happy to work hand-in-glove with the SS. Now, as for that personal experience I mentioned, and this is nobody you've ever heard of. This is just an ordinary man who got caught up in the gears of this uh, deadly machinery and somehow managed to survive as a living witness, uh, one of just a handful of Jews who personally laid eyes on Eichmann during the war and lived to tell the tale. So in April of 1944, Zef Sapir, 20 years old, was living in the village of Dobrodovo in northeastern Hungary with his parents and five younger siblings. On the 15th of that month, which uh, happened to be the last day of Passover that year, the police knocked on his door, told his family to pack what they could carry, and exit the premises. The entire Jewish population of that village, 103 people, were then marched 10 miles to Munkach, the nearest city, where they were housed at a defunct uh, brick factory uh, with 14,000 other Jews, and most of them, of course, lived outside, there was no room, and there were only uh, two functioning water faucets at that factory, and nothing to eat uh, but a few spoonfuls of potato soup every day. So... After a series of downpours, typhoid and pneumonia swept uh, the prisoners, but somehow Zeph's family avoided getting sick. So three weeks passed, during which the guards played various games to kill the boredom, for example, uh, forcing the prisoners to transfer piles of bricks from one end of the ghetto to the other for no reason whatsoever. So one afternoon in early May, the prisoners were ordered into an open area to listen to a speech by none other than Adolf Eichmann, uh, who had arrived at the factory with an entourage of 30 or so uh, SS officers. And this is what he said, quote, Jews, you have nothing to fear. You have no cause to worry. We want only what is best for you. You will leave here very shortly and be sent to very fine places indeed. You will work there, your wives will stay at home, your children will go to school, you will have wonderful lives, unquote. About two weeks later, a detachment of SS guards arrived and, using whips, forced the prisoners onto train tracks that ran adjacent to the factory. They were then told to strip. Anyone who protested or even hesitated was beaten very badly. Their clothing was searched for valuables, and any personal documentation that was found was shredded. After putting their clothes back on, Zeph and the others from his village were crammed into a single cattle car, and the door was locked behind them. They had no idea where they were going. Uh, there was no food or water, just a single bucket in which to relieve themselves. After two days, the train stopped. Uh, the door crashed open, and a guard asked if they wanted water. Uh, Zeph uh, scrambled out of the car to fill a bucket at the station where they'd stopped. When he returned, the guard knocked the bucket out of his hands onto the ground and ordered him back into the car. When they reached their destination in southern Poland uh, two days later, the door once again crashed open, uh, searchlights burning their eyes, dogs barking and snapping as the prisoners poured from the train and got their first look at what Eichmann had described as a very fine place indeed. Even before he stepped off the train, Zeph smelled the burning flesh and knew exactly what this was and where it was going. 
The guards ordered them to form a line. When the Sapirs reached the officer in front, uh, Zeph was directed to the left, while his parents, his four brothers, ages 15, 11, 6, and 3, and his eight-year-old sister, were directed to the right. He tried to join them, but he was beaten back. Uh, The two lines were then marched off in separate directions, and Zeph never saw his family again. So there's the receiving end of Eichmann's meticulous four-stage process up close and personal. And we'll come back to Zeph on our next episode because his trip to hell was only just getting started. Okay, fact number two. After the European war finally ended in May of 1945, Eichmann remained in Germany for five years undetected by war crimes investigators. Now, there are several factors that made this possible. Uh, First, he was a man who had generally worked in the shadows, at least until Hungary, where for whatever reason, he dropped his guard a bit and was more out and about. He also had a lifelong aversion to being photographed, so his pursuers had a physical description but no picture until 1947 when an Israeli investigator finally tracked down a photograph taken by one of Eichmann's mistresses during the war. And it really wasn't known what a critical role he'd played until the Nuremberg trials, where his name started coming up over and over again during testimony. But the Nuremberg trials didn't get underway until the end of 1945. So he had a good six-month grace period there where he really wasn't on anyone's radar. So after the German surrender, he immediately adopted an alias, Otto Ekman. He later explained that he chose that name because Ekman was close enough to Eichmann that he would respond uh, even if distracted. Now, every member of the Waffen-SS, the military branch which uh, Eichmann belonged to, had a small black tattoo on the underside of the left arm near the armpit uh, to indicate blood type. And these tattoos were used uh, by investigators after the war to identify these people. So even though Eichmann burned his off with a cigarette, the scar would have aroused suspicion, but for whatever reason, no one ever looked. Uh, During the five years he remained in Europe, uh, the only people who recognized him were former SS men in the various detention camps that he kind of shuttled around in 1945 as Otto Ekman, and they didn't say anything. But as I said, once the Nuremberg trials got rolling, uh, he was very much wanted by the counterintelligence corps, the CIC. Uh, These were American investigators tasked uh, with tracking down war criminals. So in early 46, well aware that he now had a target on his back, Eichmann escaped his detention camp, uh, made his way north to the British-controlled part of Germany, adopted a new alias, Otto Henninger, and presented uh, forged documents to British officials, telling them that he was a discharged regular army officer. No one bothered to look into it, and so here's Eichmann, at this point the most wanted Nazi war criminal still at large, living in this forested area in northern Germany, working as a lumberjack, while his pursuers at the CIC and at various uh, Jewish organizations still didn't really know what he looked like. So after the lumber company went under, uh, he leased some land and started a chicken farm uh, selling eggs on the black market. There were strict price controls in post-war Europe uh, that basically made it impossible to make money doing legitimate business. But by the time 1950 rolled around, uh, he was sick of it. He was sick of his life there. Chicken farming was a far cry from genocide, his natural calling, and also his fake documents were due to expire. So he took off. He tapped into an underground network for fleeing war criminals, made his way south to Austria, then Italy, uh, living in various uh, safe houses, including a monastery at one point, before shipping off to Argentina in July of 1950. Now, there's one other factor that aided Eichmann in Europe. I mentioned uh, Jewish organizations. Foremost among them was the Haganah, Hebrew for the defense, which formed in the early 20s in uh, then-British-controlled Palestine after two brutal uh, Arab riots had left over 50 Jews dead. But after the war, the Haganah made it their business to hunt Nazi war criminals, which they did with a fair amount of success. But in November of 1947, after the UN passed uh, the resolution establishing a Jewish state, but before that state formally existed, uh, they abruptly abandoned Nazi hunting and hurried back to Israel, fully expecting that it would be attacked uh, by the Arab states, which indeed it was. 
So that particular bloodhound was off Eichmann's trail, and the CIC had its own problems. They were understaffed, underfunded, and faced an enormous, really an impossible task. Entire rooms full of captured uh, Nazi records and personnel files. The Nazis uh, were very big on uh, documentation. Uh, they had an extensive list of suspects, uh, which when it was later merged with a separate list compiled by the UN War Crimes Commission, uh, had over 70,000 names. And, you know, with the Cold War heating up, uh, the pursuit of war criminals kind of lost its head of steam once the Nuremberg trials ended in October of 1946. The general feeling among the Allies was, you know, they'd fried the big fish, the ones that hadn't killed themselves. And now, you know, it wasn't the Germans, but the Russians they needed to worry about in Europe. So these are some of the factors that helped Eichmann and many other war criminals kind of uh, slither through the net uh, during that chaotic period of martial law in post-war Europe. And so Eichmann, uh, using yet another alias, Ricardo Clement, uh, slipped off to Argentina, which at that time was led by General Juan Perón, who was a longtime fan of both Mussolini and Hitler. He called the Nuremberg trials, quote, a disgrace and an unfortunate lesson for the future of humanity, unquote. So Perón uh, was a fascist sympathizer, basically a fascist himself, and eager to import as many Nazis as he possibly could to put their scientific and industrial knowledge to use and advance his national interests. And so Argentina, especially Buenos Aires, was loaded with former Nazis when Eichmann showed up in the summer of 1950. Okay, fact number three. In Argentina, where he lived in a variety of places, ultimately ending up in a neighborhood in northern Buenos Aires called San Fernando, Eichmann made two big mistakes that helped seal his eventual doom. In 1952, he got word to his wife Vera in Germany that he was alive, and then sent money and instructions on how to join him in Argentina, which she did with their three sons. And then Eichmann made his first big mistake. He allowed his sons to use their true last name. Now, he tried to explain this later by saying that he didn't want his family to have to lie for him, which is absurd. He had them lie for him repeatedly in Argentina. But this really came back to bite him in 1956 when his oldest son, Klaus, uh, who went by Nick Eichmann, started casually dating a young woman named Sylvia Herman, who had him over for dinner one night at the house where she lived with her 55-year-old father, who, unbeknownst to Nick, was not only Jewish, but had been a prisoner at the Dachau uh, concentration camp in 1935 on suspicion of espionage. And one of uh, many vicious beatings there uh, had cost him the sight in one eye. Uh, but he was eventually released and got out of Europe in 1938 and ended up in Buenos Aires. So, during dinner, uh, Nick made a series of anti-Semitic remarks. Among them, quote, It would have been better if the Germans had finished their job of extermination, unquote. So the apple uh, didn't fall far from the tree. Now, Mr. Herman later said that he actually barely noticed uh, these remarks uh, since they were so common in Buenos Aires. So he just steered the conversation elsewhere and the evening ran its course. But... In April of 1957, Sylvia, uh, no longer seeing Nick, was reading an article to her father about a war crimes trial in Frankfurt, and the article mentioned this SS big shot still at large, Adolf Eichmann, whose family had vanished from Germany just five years earlier. So this was a light bulb moment that they both immediately thought of Nick Eichmann. He had told her that he lived with his uncle, that his father had been an army officer, uh, whereabouts unknown presumed dead. But it occurred to her that she'd never been invited to his home. So she got the address through a mutual friend, uh, showed up one day, and knocked on the door. A woman with a toddler in her arms answered the door. This was Vera with their youngest son, Ricardo Francisco, the only one born in Argentina. Uh, he was named after an Italian priest who had helped Eichmann escape Europe. So Sylvia is making small talk when a man uh, walks in from another room who looked to her to be in his late 50s and introduced himself as Nick's uncle. A few minutes later, Nick comes home and gets visibly flustered, uh, saying to Sylvia, Who gave you my address? Who invited you to visit me? Uh, but this uh, supposed uncle uh, cut him off, uh, saying, You know, everything's fine. You're more than welcome. But as they were leaving, Nick, not the sharpest uh, tool in the shed, said, 
All right, father, I'll see Sylvia off to the bus, uh, contradicting Adolf's story. So Mr. Herman, after hearing all this, uh, sat down and wrote a letter to the Frankfurt prosecutor mentioned in that article, relaying his suspicions and providing Eichmann's current address. Now, the prosecutor, Fritz Bauer, who was also Jewish and had also uh, been a prisoner in a concentration camp in the 30s, had the wisdom not to reveal the contents of that letter to the West German authorities. In the next section, I'll explain why that was wise, but instead uh, reached out to Felix Schienar, uh, Israel's uh, sort of quasi-ambassador to West Germany. I say quasi because Israel and West Germany uh, did not formalize diplomatic relations until 1965. But this letter, a direct byproduct of Eichmann's idiotic decision to let his sons use the family name, uh, sparked the fire that eventually burned him to the ground. Now, his second mistake, which didn't really aid his pursuers, but did provide a treasure trove of self-incriminating evidence, was the decision to record his memoirs on tape in a series of interviews with Willem Sassen, a Dutch-born uh, former SS officer who had escaped military prison after the war and ended up in Buenos Aires. So in the spring of 57, right around the time of that surprise visit by Sylvia Herman, Eichmann would visit Sassen every Sunday. Uh, Sassen would place a tape recorder on the desk, and Eichmann would recount uh, pretty much everything he'd done, uh, saying at one point, quote, the only good enemy of the Reich is a dead one. And I must say, I carried out my orders with pride, and I am proud of that to this day. It was my job to catch our Jewish enemies like fish in a net and transport them to their final destination, unquote. And then about his actions in Holland, quote, I sent my boxcars to Amsterdam, and most of the 140,000 Dutch Jews were directed to the gas chambers at Bergen-Belsen, Sobibor, and Auschwitz. It went beautifully. Even so, there are a lot of Jews enjoying life today who ought to have been gassed, unquote. So, I mean, you can't say he was inconsistent. I mean, uh, give the devil his due. Uh, he earned that pitchfork. But why do this? Why did Eichmann record such incriminating remarks on tape? I think several reasons. Uh, first of all, he probably got complacent, which after 12 years of outfoxing the hounds is natural. And Sassen uh, was his closest friend there. They liked uh, to drink wine and talk. So it kind of developed out of that. And he also, he had almost a compulsion uh, to rehash the war. You know, a lot of former Nazis there um, had sort of moved on. But Eichmann was constantly railing to Sassen and others about all the people who had uh, supposedly betrayed the Third Reich, uh, how things uh, would have gone differently if not for this or that. So he was a man who was trapped in his past, uh, not because of any guilt feelings, quite the opposite, actually. Uh, his past, the war, uh, had been the high point of his life. Uh, while his present was fairly depressing. You know, he, was a kind of, he was kind of a failure in Argentina. He had no head for business other than the business of killing Jews. He had a series of uh, menial jobs before uh, finally getting a job at a Mercedes-Benz plant where he eventually rose to foreman. But his job there was arranged for him by fellow Nazis uh, who had been his underlings during the war. And at the time of these interviews with Sassen, he was renting a pretty crappy house that was too small for his family. And to add insult to injury from his perspective, uh, his landlord was Jewish. So he kind of gravitated toward this uh, retrospective fantasy world. Uh, he would buy and devour every book he could find about the war, uh, scribbling his thoughts in the margins. So these interviews probably served uh, to resurrect his self-esteem as twisted as that sounds, but Sassen would later sell these interviews to Life magazine and a German magazine called Der Stern. So these uh, damning remarks uh, by Eichmann were widely disseminated and certainly uh, made his eventual prosecutor, uh, Gideon Hausner's job, a lot easier. Okay, fact number four. Fritz Bauer, the West German prosecutor, relayed the information he had received about Eichmann to Israel and not West Germany for political reasons. So the chancellor at that time, the first West German chancellor, was Konrad Adenauer. And he was okay, actually more than okay. He had been courageous as the mayor of Köln, or Cologne as we call it, in opposing the Nazis and was quickly forced out of office once Hitler took power. He had his bank accounts frozen and, and was arrested and jailed more than once by the Nazis. Uh, not in a concentration camp, but a regular jail. 
And then after the war, uh, he fully acknowledged the atrocities and would later forge a reparations agreement with Israel. But as chancellor, he basically ignored uh, the wartime backgrounds of people in his government if he felt that they were competent and useful. And it turned out that there were a great many uh, competent and useful former Nazis that held critical posts in West Germany in the 1950s to the tune of about a third of Adenauer's cabinet, a quarter of the Bundestag, that's the German uh, federal parliament, and a big chunk of the civil service, uh, judiciary, and foreign ministry. Now, the most powerful of all these former Nazis, and the one who gave uh, Fritz Bauer the greatest pause, was Hans Globke, uh, Adenauer's chief of staff. He had been a lawyer, then a powerful judge under Hitler. He actually helped write uh, the anti-Semitic Nuremberg Laws in 1935, and then later served as chief legal advisor to the Office of Jewish Affairs, working under Adolf Eichmann. So Bauer felt that since an Eichmann trial in West Germany would necessarily shine a harsh new light on Globke's past, that the West German authorities, if approached, would find a reason not to extradite Eichmann, or even worse, uh, bungle it somehow or tip him off uh, so they could keep uh, Globke, uh, who was useful not just to Adenauer, but to the United States as well. Among Globke's many responsibilities was the oversight of the West German intelligence service called the BND. And so Globke was the primary contact uh, for the CIA in West Germany. And of course, uh, Berlin was a major Cold War hotspot. So Globke had very powerful friends in both Adenauer and Alan Dulles, who was the director of the Central Intelligence Agency at that time. So this is why uh, Bauer took a hard pass on his own uh, government and went to the Israelis instead. Now, one more quick point about West Germany in the 1950s. There were troubling signs, especially later in the decade, that despite uh, Germany's best efforts to shut the door on their recent past, that that past was not entirely behind them. On the one hand, uh, there was a lot of whitewashing of the war. Uh, West German school children in the 1950s got a heavily redacted, uh, sanitized version of the Hitler uh, regime that focused mostly on economic issues and battles and so forth. And the death camps were disposed of usually in a couple of vague sentences or just went unmentioned. But at the same time, you had the rise of the ultra-right-wing German Reich Party, which made significant gains in the regional elections of 1959. And then during Christmas that year, there was a week-long outbreak of uh, anti-Semitic attacks across West Germany that made international headlines. And not attacks on people. There, there weren't that many Jews left in Germany. I mean, in 1933, there had been over half a million. Uh, in the 50s, there were fewer than 40,000. Uh, but swastikas uh, painted on synagogues, Jewish cemeteries uh, desecrated, obviously a coordinated thing. Now, Adenauer uh, did deliver a national uh, radio address denouncing this, but membership in these militant nationalist organizations was on the rise. And so this is one of several reasons why Israel felt that a public trial of Eichmann shown all over the world and recorded for posterity was so important that it could serve as a kind of countermeasure against uh, not just the whitewashing of the war in Germany and elsewhere, but against the possible reemergence of the Nazi phenomenon. Okay, fact number five, our final fact for today. The Israeli team of operatives assigned uh, to snatch Eichmann in Argentina and get him back to Israel for a trial uh, was drawn from two intelligence agencies, uh, both formed in 1949 and both still in existence. So the first is Mossad, Israel's national intelligence agency, directed at that time by a guy named Isar Harel, who would personally travel to Buenos Aires to oversee this operation. Uh, the other agency was Shin Bet, Israel's internal security service, uh, roughly comparable to our FBI. So each member of this team, there were eight, had extensive experience in covert operations, and they had also uh, each lost family in the Holocaust. Actually, uh, one of them, Moshe Tabor, uh, his entire family had been wiped out in Lithuania. And after the war, uh, he had joined uh, various Avenger groups. The, you know, there was a kind of uh, a Wild West period in Europe just after the war. And there were these Jewish Avenger groups that captured and killed a number of SS men. So Tabor's first response, uh, when chosen for this Eichmann mission, he said, you know, why go to all this trouble? 
of transporting him back to Israel. Why not just kill him? He said, you know, I saw the survivors of those death camps in 1945. What chance did he ever give them to defend themselves? And actually, the idea of assassinating Eichmann uh, was briefly considered. Just, uh, you know, break his neck and fabricate a car crash or something. And the world would never know uh, who had killed him or even if it was Eichmann that had been killed. You know, Israel had done uh, targeted assassinations before this point. They've done a number of them since. Actually, they just did one in Iran a few months ago. They're very good at it. But in this case, the idea was rejected by both Harel and Prime Minister uh, David Ben-Gurion, who very much wanted not just a trial, but a referendum on the Holocaust. He thought it was really important that even if justice wants, the Jews themselves and not some uh, international military tribunal with one eye on justice and the other on the Cold War, would prosecute and judge their murderer in their own country and not just bump him off in some alley in Buenos Aires. And it was also felt that testimony by living witnesses could be useful, and not just in the service of justice, but as a kind of a public ventilation. You know, a lot of survivors in Israel and elsewhere uh, didn't really talk about it, what they'd been through. And sadly, a significant number, especially in the period right after the war, were unable to live with those losses and memories and committed suicide. So it was felt that the trial could kind of place the Holocaust in the light for all to see, and that this could potentially be useful to the survivors as well. But first, for any of that to even be possible, they had to get this guy. So the first step was in March of 1960. A team member named Tzvi Aharoni traveled alone to Buenos Aires, and his goal was simple. Verification. Just make sure, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt, that this uh, Ricardo Clement was Adolf Eichmann. Now, Eichmann had moved since Fritz Bauer had gotten that letter with his address back in 1957. But Aharoni was able to locate his current residence, rented a truck, and drove by a number of times. And at first, he had his doubts. To him, it looked more like a rundown jail than a house. Uh, chicken wire fencing around the property, barred windows. It was hard to accept that such a big shot, or former big shot, would live in such a dump which of course may have been the point. But eventually, Aharoni saw a man in the yard taking down wash from a clothesline, and this man clearly matched the description he'd been given. Correct height, a high sloped forehead, uh, the right age. So Aharoni had a local contact approach Eichmann, ostensibly to ask for directions somewhere, and covertly take some photos of Eichmann with a hidden camera, which turned out remarkably well. You can see two of them in Bascom's book. And so after studying these photos, Aharoni sent a coded message from the Israeli embassy back to Mossad headquarters saying the driver is black, meaning that Eichmann had been ID'd and they were good to go. Now this mission presented a number of major challenges. First of all, uh, they would be 9,000 miles from home in a country where they didn't really know the terrain or the language beyond a few phrases. It was also a country, as I said, uh, with a substantial uh, Nazi and neo-Nazi presence and a general climate of anti-Semitism. Actually, earlier that year, uh, there had been a series of attacks on synagogues and Jewish homes in Buenos Aires, possibly a copycat of what had happened in Germany over Christmas. And also, you know, while the mission was certainly justified on a moral level, it was, in fact, illegal. It was not exactly uh, pro forma extradition by any stretch of the imagination. So if caught, uh, the operatives could wind up in prison, which could have political ramifications as well. And finally, you know, don't forget, Adolf Eichmann had been a highly ranked officer in one of the deadliest security forces in the history of the planet. Uh, he was an expert in surveillance and operational tactics. So even at age 54, it wasn't guaranteed that he would be some pushover. I mean, he was smart, he was cunning, and had proven himself both vigilant and resourceful for 15 years. Now, to soften up some of that vigilance, uh, the Israelis threw a kind of uh, head fake by planting a false story through Fritz Bauer. Uh, just before the team started to filter into Buenos Aires in late April, early May of 1960, uh, Bauer held a press conference in Frankfurt announcing a major investigation into Eichmann's possible presence in Kuwait, of all places. This was a complete fiction, but the Israelis thought that this might bring Eichmann's guard down a little. 
So as they arrived in Buenos Aires, each member of this team was met by a local operative and given a different uh, fake identity from the one that they traveled under with new papers as well. Uh, Later on, they would be given a third fake identity before leaving the country. So once this was done, they obtained, uh, first of all, money that had been sent in advance to cover uh, various costs, uh, car rentals, rental of a safe house where they could stash Eichmann after the snatch, food, hotels, etc. So they got the money and then some critical items that had also been sent in advance, including uh, handcuffs, forgery kits, sedation drugs, lock picks, miniature drills and other woodworking tools, and finally makeup kits with false teeth and wigs. Back in a moment. Your feedback is important to us. On Twitter, at Gotham Variety, on our Facebook page, or you can email the program, joe at gothamvariety.com. Really, however you'd like to engage with us, we love engaging with you. And if you'd like to join our family and get exclusive access to bonus content, please go to patreon.com slash gothamvariety and subscribe. And that'll do it for part one of this special two-part episode of Real Time 1960s on Gotham Variety. Don't forget to check us out and subscribe on Apple, Stitcher, or Spotify so you don't miss a single episode. Follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash realtime1960s. Thanks so much for joining us. Take care and keep an eye out for part two in about two weeks. 